for Knox United Church. It's great to have you here with us. I'm glad you could join us today. As we gather for worship today, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory, an ancestral land of several Indigenous nations, and part of the homeland of the Métis people. We respect the sacredness of the ground on which we walk, and we cherish its stewardship down through the centuries. Amen. Come here in anticipation. Come here in hope. Come here in trust that God is always with us. We are not just invited, we are welcomed into this community of seekers for faith. Here we celebrate the Spirit's nurturing breath. Here we name ourselves people who seek to follow Jesus' ways. Here we find our place among all things in the light of God's love. So let's hear and feel and see and taste God's presence with us here in this time and in this place. Let us pray. Through the gift of gathered community, May we know with attentive care, abundant beauty, and powerful reconciliation as people of faith and followers of Jesus' ways. In a pause of silence, may we hear God call each of us by name and know that we are welcomed and enfolded by love in the heart of holiness. May the call of the risen Christ guide our ways. May we be held, uplifted, fed in body and spirit, and loved into full life. Amen. Our candles are good reminders of the many ways that we experience God in our lives and in the world. So I light one candle for God, Creator from which all things spring, the largest, the least, the nearest, and the farthest. And I light a candle for God in the Spirit, that which ties everything together, connects all spirits everywhere, connects you with all of creation. And a candle for God in the Christ, the way in which we experience God most intimately, most personally, most closely, perhaps. And finally, I lit our peace candle, a gift from another church, a reminder that peace is the most cherished possession and dream of every heart and every nation. We have candles for God, candles for the people of God. In our holy conversation, we try to look inside ourselves, looking at the ways that we could redirect our lives to more closely follow the pathways of Jesus' ways, the ways of the Spirit. So let's pray a few moments. God calls to us, speaks our name, and invites us to the living water. Jesus calls to us, speaks our name, and promises to be the light of the world. The Spirit calls to us, speaks our name, and lifts us to a vision of new possibilities. May we hear the call of the Holy Voice today, however it comes, and hear in it words of forgiveness and grace for all the ways we have failed to live out our faith in our words and our actions. May we find new paths that take us closer to the center of faithful living. May we join our hearts with the heart of holiness and commit ourselves to a world made new in us and in our living. May we know God's presence like a healing stream, like a burning sun, like a gentle rain, like a living light. Amen. Our scripture today is from Acts 4, 5 to 12. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. 
When they had made the prisoner stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and, had, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. From John 10, 11 to 18, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The image of a shepherd, or particularly the good shepherd, is well known in John's Gospel, and so it's then well known to most people who have been churchgoers for some time. The Good Shepherd, laying down his life at the Father's command. The Shepherd brings the sheep together into one flock, we are told. I think that's the key piece of the passage today, that idea of one shepherd. The Good Shepherd being a force for unity, for unification among people of faith everywhere. Then Luke, in the book of Acts, in his sequel to his gospel, talks of Jesus as the rejected stone of the builders that becomes the chief cornerstone. The listeners to that book would be well familiar with the need for a strong and stable foundation for any building. So Peter is explaining the power to perform a miraculous healing, much to the consternation of the leaders of his time and place. Luke and John, with the Good Shepherd and the Cornerstone imagery, explain the awe-inspiring power of Jesus during his life and then, following his resurrection, his continuing power through the deeds of his disciples. It's the intimate connection to God that makes the difference. Jesus confounds earthly comparisons, makes lesser metaphors kind of meaningless. The Good Shepherd operates at God's command. That's something that's very clear. In the universal, holy connection that encompasses all sheep everywhere. Jesus acknowledges in this speech that there are other sheep that do not belong to this fold. By this he's meaning that not only the Jews of Israel, but people everywhere, even non-Jewish Gentiles, are part of this flock of Jesus that he's going to look after, protect, and command, just like a shepherd commands his flock. Now that's a huge statement in the year 90 or so when John's Gospel was being written. There's already friction at that time between the synagogues of that time and place and the emerging Christian communities. There's already tension between those two groups. And for John to have Jesus say that there are, there are sheep not of the fold of Israel is an abrasive, reactionary kind of statement. 
John's statement is that the boundaries of all Judaism are not large enough to contain the message and mission of Jesus' followers and their descendants. If Jesus' message of forgiveness, repentance, and loving, sacrificial welcome to, into the realm of God by the Good Shepherd is indeed universal, then that has a lot to say, even to us today. One flock, one shepherd. Quite a statement. In this Gospel passage, all people everywhere are given into the loving care and protection of the Good Shepherd. That's a challenge for us, I think. In our church of today, we have many, many flocks. And sometimes, they don't get along so well together. There's fierce disagreements and controversies about a whole host of things, about what to sing and how to pray and what constitutes a good worship service. We disagree vehemently about the nature of God and Jesus and Spirit and how those all work together. We look down our noses at those others who don't think or act or pray or speak or sing like we do. We just wish that all Christians would be like us and then everything would be okay. Well, that conflict and controversy has colored Christian thought down through the centuries. It's been a source of untold bloodshed and has cost countless lives. Heretics have been defined and labeled and branded and killed. Question becomes, who decides? Who decides who's in and who's out? Who decides who is a true Christian and who is not? Who has the authority to, and who, to decide who is correct and incorrect? And what gives them that authority? Too often, down through history, it's been all about just the exercise of power and retaining that power. Now in the early years of the Jesus movement, even before it became known as Christianity, the controversy was about whether or not followers of Jesus' way needed to come strictly from within Jewish ranks, from within the ranks of Jewish believers. That's what John's Gospel is pointed to today. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Jesus is talking about non-Jewish people who also want to become followers of Jesus' way. Others, not just Jews, he says, can legitimately become part of this movement. That controversy in the early church carried on for some years. There's several arguments in the book of Acts between particularly the evangelist Paul and the leaders of the Jerusalem church as to whether or not everyone had to go through Judaism to get to Christianity. In the end, non-Jews were welcomed. Even there, though, it gets tricky, doesn't it? Who decides? On what basis is a person welcomed? What do they have to do, or say, or show? It rubs right up against us today, this question. How are new folks admitted to the ranks of the faithful? Who is okay? And how is that decided? We struggle with that even today. I think it's well known that church congregations generally have a certain look or feel to them. There's a kind of homogeneity to a church congregation. It may have something to do with the unstated characteristics of class or culture or education, or social status, or ability, or other aspects of the people involved. It's almost never overt and stated and named. It's almost always discounted in its power. Oh, that doesn't apply here, we would say. But it is indeed powerful. All sorts of subtle social cues that define who is more or less like us and therefore worthy to be admitted to our ranks. Now, every church congregation will say that it is welcoming, but that welcome is very often limited in many ways. 
Many congregations struggle to get over this, and yet they wind up being very homogeneous anyway. I think in many ways, Knox is no different. We have that same struggle. However, even in spite of this, I've been impressed in my 11 years with Knox at the way that the congregation members here go out of their way to be appropriate and welcoming and respectful to newcomers. They support people who are trying the church, and they do it in a very gracious and careful way. And I've been impressed by that. I've appreciated that a lot. But still, we are much alike among ourselves, aren't we? There's not really very much breadth of culture between others and ourselves in this unstated, white, middle-class kind of congregation. We've been graciously welcoming to those who are more or less like us, largely similar. We struggle to offer the same easy welcome to those who show a different face to us and to the world. Where, for example, are our indigenous neighbors? Where are folks of other racial backgrounds? Where are those on social assistance? Or those who struggle to pay their bills each month? Where are those with less education or without nice clothes to wear on a Sunday morning? What is it about us that prevents those folks from showing up or from perhaps staying around, even if they have tried us out? Are we indeed truly open to those who are not of this fold? Well, no longer can the church afford to be for people just like us, at least not exclusively. We must be for those who are not like us too. And that's uncomfortable, perhaps even distressing for those of us who have been around for a while. I think we're afraid. We're afraid that we won't recognize this new church if many other people different from us become involved as well. We're afraid that we'll be the ones who are uncomfortable in our own church. And yet, isn't the fabric of life so much richer if it's made from different pieces and patterns and wonderful items. Isn't the fabric of faith like that too? It too is richer in diversity. Our faith is stronger, it's more robust when it's characterized by difference and variety. We must not just tolerate difference. We must actively seek it out, embrace it, and welcome the gifts the difference in variety and diversity bring. It's something for us to work on, to be sure. It's a challenge for us. If the Good Shepherd is the protector and guide for a universal flock, then we need to be welcoming, truly inviting and embracing for all people. <coughs> we need to invite them to the table too, and mean it. Our manager needs to be Come as you are, however you are. We need to find ways to break down the natural intimidation that our own building has for newcomers. And that's a challenge for us here at Knox. But we need mostly to open up our own minds and hearts and connect with those who are not like us at all. That's what the Good Shepherd requires. That's what the Church's future requires. That's what our faith requires. Amen. Here's a message about some of the mission work of our church that is supported through your gifts to the Mission and Service Fund of our United Church of Canada. Rendezvous 2020, the United Church's National Youth and Young Adult Gathering, was at an event like no other, just as 2020 was a year like no other. In late April, the Rendezvous design team decided there couldn't be a large gathering in Calgary because of COVID-19. Plans that had been in the works for over a year were scrapped. Disappointment reigned, and there was wavering about whether to postpone it to 2021, cancel completely, or reimagine. After anxious conversations, disagreements, and a few tears, 
the decision was made to reimagine Rendezvous 2020 as an online event. The team wanted young people to know that the church understood all they were missing, cared for them even if they couldn't be with them in person, and wanted to bless them. Rendezvous 2020 Reimagined, held August 11th to 14th, was much like a face-to-face -face event. There were engaging keynote speakers, lively worship sessions, home groups, a service project, as well as workshops and spiritual practice sessions, too numerous to list. Each morning started with teachings by elders, and each evening ended with a fun social time. Photos were shared, chats occurred, and exhibits viewed. Some people participated from home, others took part while camping, and some joined in from their church parking lots. More than 480 young people attended the various activities over the course of the event. There were participants from every province in Canada, as well as denominations, including Anglican, Lutheran, and United Church of Christ. The virtual nature of the event drew the circle wider than ever. Global partners from around the world, including Philippines, Palestine, France, and Kenya, joined in. Together, the participants shared bold faith, created brave space, and offered one another brazen grace, all from a safe distance. Several young people thanked the Church for finding a creative way to host running. One participant wrote, Thank you so much for continuing with Rendezvous. I find it difficult to be in social settings at the best of times, so this was wonderful for me. I did miss creating those physical connections, but I'm glad we were still able to gather from a safe distance. Following a keynote moving speech by Dr. James Makokas, a leader and well-known expert with the Indigenous LGBTQ2 and medical community, one young person wrote, Being a young person going through college, it makes me feel so much better when I hear someone who has failed but was able to get back on their feet. It's so inspiring. Your gifts through mission and service are hard at work in these challenging times supporting youth and young adults. Thank you. Your gifts help transform and save lives, inspire meaning and purpose, and build a better world. In our community prayer, we look beyond ourselves, into the world around us, and look for all the ways that we connect with that world, and the ways in which that connection can help transform it ever more closely toward the realm of heaven around us. So let's pray a few moments. I'd like you to spend a bit of time with my words today, to think about what things might look like in a world where no one is left out. Don't start to ponder everything that makes such a world impossible, because that can close you off to what is possible. The words that follow are based on Psalm 23. I offer them as a way out of the impossible and into the possible. In our faith in a shepherding God, we begin to picture a world where no one is left behind, where all lie down in green pastures, where all walk beside still waters, where all souls are restored, where no one need fear evil, and all know God's protection and comfort. We imagine a world where everyone has a place at the table, while well, all are anointed into the oil of holy love, where everyone's cup overflows with fullness. May goodness and mercy be our lives guiding ways as we strive for a world where every person and all of creation find their place in the house of God. In the ways of Jesus, we find a path of grace that changes the world. May our lives be a testimony that love is stronger than doubt, or fear, or even death. As followers of the Good Shepherd, may we be led in the way to peace and justice. From the place of holiness within our humanity, may we learn to transform the world around us, 
opening our hearts and our lives to the spirit of compassion for everyone. May we love, not only in word or speech, but in truth and in action. Now, in the ancient words of the prayer of Jesus from the foundations of our faith of long ago, we say, Our Creator, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May we go from here with God's love shining out through our lives. May we go from here with the call of Jesus challenging us in our ways and in our deeds. May we go from here with the wind of the Spirit lifting us up and showing us new horizons for our vision and for our lives. May we go from here in God's love and in God's peace. Amen.